Han har allihopa till det här mötet inom Forum för Digitala Maniora. Jag heter Per Kullhed och arbetar som utvecklingsstrateg här på biblioteket. Vår gäst idag är Peter Leonard från Yale University Library Digital Humanities Lab som kommit hit enkom för att hålla två föreläsningar om digital humaniora. En idag och en imorgon, precis samma tid. De är lika välkomna då som nu. Och för oss här i Uppsala är det som nu ganska brett satsar på digital humaniora är det ju naturligtvis jätteintressant för oss att få höra mer om de här frågorna, hur man arbetar med dem på Yale. Peter är direktör för Åhanstående Lab och är doktor i litteraturvetenskap, skandinavistik från University of Washington i Seattle. Och det finns också en Sverige bakgrund ska jag säga och det är orsaken till att jag presenterar Peter på svenska här. Peter var Fulbright skadad här i Uppsala för ungefär tio år sedan och pratade utmärkt svenska. Han kommer att hålla sitt föredrag på engelska men i frågestunden efteråt så går det bra att ställa frågor på svenska eller engelska om så vill. Och Peter ska prata om Digital Humanities Method for the Literary Scholar and Visual Culture Computation. Varsågod, Peter. Tack. Så tack Per och tack alla ni som har kommit hit. Det är ju inte bara att vara tillbaka i Uppsala. Jag var här som sagt för tio år sedan. Jag var, min anknytning var med vad den, den tiden kallades för um, Centrum för Multietnisk Forskning. Fast för det mesta tiden var jag ute på Engelska parken och så jag lärde mig känna många från uh, Littvet och nordiska studier och det är schysst att få folk här därifrån idag. Um, som sagt kommer jag att presentera idag på engelska, lite brist på fackspråk när det gäller digital humanities i mitt eget förståelse av språket. Det tar gärna emot frågor efteråt på svenska. Um, and I think as, as Per's introduction made clear, my own background is deeply uh, in the humanities. I was an uh, art history major in college, an undergraduate, and then I got my PhD in Scandinavian literature. So there's nothing in my background, which is computer science. I'm completely unqualified to talk about some of the more technical aspects, which do underlie a lot of work in the digital humanities. But what I'm going to be talking about today is basically the techniques and the methods that professors and students at Yale University find meaningful, the things that they come to the lab to do. And I'm also going to be talking about some techniques and methods that I myself have personally found meaningful in working with um, digitized cultural heritage material, whether that is visual or textual. So this is really just going to be a snapshot of what's going on in New Haven, Connecticut when it comes to digital humanities. What I know best is how we're trying to serve the scholars at Yale, and so I can give you just a quick brief um, overview of that. And the things I'm going to be talking about today, again, come from my own experience, um, and I'm going to try to explain them as best I can uh, using my kind of humanities background. There's certainly a lot of material on the screen. There'll be a lot of confusing visualizations. I can promise you that. So it's not important that you grasp everything that's going on on the screen. I think my goals for today would just be to have folks come away with a sense of what are maybe five or six methods in textual analysis and five or six methods in visual analysis that folks are using nowadays um, for in the digital humanities. And certainly during the question and answer section, I'd love to learn more about what's going on in Uppsala as well as Sweden more broadly, because I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that I could learn from you. So that's what we're going to talk about today. What do we think is going on right now at Yale, and what do we think is promising for the future? And it is um, meaningful, I think, to begin a little bit with the history of digital humanities at Yale. I don't know if there's anybody in the room who might recognize the fellow on the far right of the screen. This is a Jesuit priest. His name is Father Roberto Busa. Um, Busa was an, a scholar of Thomas Aquinas, and um, his, the way he wanted to get at the sort of essence of Aquinas was to digitize everything that Thomas Aquinas wrote and to put it into a mainframe. And that's actually what Roberto Busa is doing in 1956 in the city of New Haven on Yale's campus in this picture right here. So what Busa is doing is looking at a facsimile of Thomas Aquinas' writings, and then he, I don't know if anybody in the room recognizes what this is on top of. It's a teletype machine. It's what you used to have to use to communicate with a computer before CRTs or cathode ray tubes became common. It's like just basically a typewriter hooked up to a mainframe. And Busa is building a corpus. He's building a collection of Thomas Aquinas' writing. 
As I mentioned, this picture was taken in 1956 when Busa came to New Haven to do work. And the other early landmark in the history of Yale Digital Humanities is this book on the bottom here of the screen. Um, this is a, a conference that was held in New Haven in 1965. It was sponsored by IBM, and the title of the conference was Computers for the Humanities? Question mark. Um, the symbology of these conference proceedings, uh, those of you may recognize the statue, the thinker, right? And um, does anybody recognize, it's probably hard to see in this resolution, but the, um, the thinker, the outline of the thinker, has been peppered with holes. And the holes are what were in punch cards. So those early forms of data, pieces of paper with holes punched in them that you would feed into a mainframe. So that's the way 1965 sought to symbolize this uh, sort of synthesis of digital in the, hum in the humanities. That was in the mid-century. Um, what's happened in New Haven recently? Well, um, I should first of all say that we don't have a Department of Digital Humanities at Yale. I don't anticipate us ever necessarily having a Department of Digital Humanities, but there's a lot of interest nevertheless. Um, back in about 10 years ago, there was a lot of interest from graduate students who formed a Digital Humanities Working Group. In 2013, I joined the institution um, as the first librarian for digital humanities research. So I was a librarian working alongside our history librarian, our English librarian, but I had responsibility for digital humanities. And then in 2015, we received a substantial grant from a outside, a private foundation to begin the digital humanities lab. And that's what's been going on for the last three years. The support that we received there was partly in order to put arts and humanities in conversation with STEM, and people who do that oftentimes use the acronym STEAM, which is a very confusing acronym because it's like STEM plus arts and the humanities with a silent H, you get STEAM. <laughs> um, as part of that grant, we're doing a lot of things, we're renovating space, we're doing a lot of projects, but most crucially we're able to bring in three employees into the library. And each of those employees is designed to help scholars do digital humanities work. So my team of three members includes a programmer and a user interface designer and an outreach and engagement specialist. So those three employees together with me make up the digital humanities team, which is dedicated to help Yale scholars do work in the digital humanities. And uh, midway through the next year, in 2018, we're gonna be moving into a newly renovated space. It's almost 500 square meters. Um, in the equivalent of, of Carolina, it's the Sterling Memorial Library. So it's uh, at a very centric, uh, central place on campus, very central place inside the library is being turned into a, um, a kind of central support space for the digital humanities. Um, one of the, I, just to be very quickly, because there are some folks here from the academic side today, I wanted to talk about what we do in the digital humanities that touches academics. And one of the things we do is we support teaching assistants, which at Yale we call teaching fellows, but the more common term in the United States is teaching assistants. Um, and these folks are humanities graduate students. And it's very common in the United States, of course, to teach as part of humanities graduate education. If you're a French literature student, you help you either teach yourself French or you might help a professor teach a large enrollment class. What the Digital Humanities Lab does is it accepts applications from graduate students such as the people on the screen here. Um, this is hard to read, but it's basically English department, history, um, all sorts of different departments here. Graduate students come to us and say, I want to bring digital humanities methods to a class. And in some cases, they are confident, they know how to do these digital humanities methods. And they say, all I need is just um, you know, that funding to be a digital humanities teaching assistant. And in other cases, they don't. They don't know how to do digital humanities themselves. So the lab will work with them in order to be able to teach them to get to a point where they can teach Yale college students, Yale undergraduate students. We've worked with 13 so far. These have been great folks. A typical example is somebody is a graduate student in Latin American history. His or her professor is teaching a class on Latin American history for undergraduates. And um, this student will say, I want to come in and do something about historic maps of colonial era Latin America, or I want to do textual analysis and kind of revolutionary rhetoric when these countries begin to seek their independence. And we'll help them do that and in turn uh, cycle that into the undergraduate experience. We also have a couple postdoctoral associates in the lab every year. These are just some samples of folks with whom we've worked. They come in for a year, and they're um, physically uh, present in the library, but they're actually appointed through the academic department at Yale. 
So what this means is that they are, um, they have a mentor in a department such as English or Comp Lit, and they are deeply embedded into not only the Digital Humanities Lab, but also into the department at Yale, which provides them a kind of um, disciplinary context. Um, we help them do projects over the course of that year. And I mention our teaching fellows and our postdoctoral associates as evidence of how we're trying to learn from departments about what digital humanities means to them. When we founded the Digital Humanities Lab in 2015, we very self-consciously didn't want to define the digital humanities for Yale. We wanted to listen to what the French department and the Italian department and the English department thought the digital humanities was. We wanted to learn from their understanding so that we could serve them better. And so our teaching assistants and our postdocs help us do that. And finally, we have a, a leadership made up of a faculty digital humanities committee, which is chaired by our Dean of the Arts and the Humanities, who's also an English professor. There's a whole bunch of great humanities and even some computer science faculty on this committee. So they help us ensure that we are being disciplinarily relevant and that we are meaningful to the humanities experience broadly at Yale. Um, I think one of the things that uh, I want to talk about today in the context of disciplinary relevance and in the context of making sure that as we do digital humanities, we keep the focus on the humanities, is just some quick summarizations of what I see as characterizing modern DH. And by that I just mean not 1956 uh, mainframes like Roberto Busa was doing, which was incredibly important, he's totally a pioneer, but as we head into 2018, what does the world look like? What does the landscape look like? At least as judged by what we see in New Haven. And I think that um, a couple things characterize the digital humanities, at least as far as I can tell. And one of them is a kind of theoretical and almost a moral turn towards considering the wide variety of human cultural output that goes beyond the canon that most of us are taught to read in graduate school. It doesn't replace a focus on authorship or well-understood movements or um, any sort of great texts, but it rather engages alongside our understanding of mainstream literary movements, famous authors. Of course, the simple reason why this is possible is there's now 30 million books that have been digitized in Google Books, and this is far more than the couple hundred that we're expected to read in our graduate training. So we can't closely read at 30 million books in Google Books, but with the help of algorithms, we might be able to do some careful and nuanced engagements with these large databases that characterize modern scholarship. And in fact, that leads to my second point, which is the notion of algorithms supporting close reading. Now, this can seem like a kind of contradiction, that there is an absolute dichotomy between the seminar table in the English park reading texts closely and the kind of large-scale text mining that commercial companies like Google or Facebook or others engage in. But of course, in order for this stuff to be meaningful for the humanities, the algorithms have to support the close reading, the close watching, in the case of film studies, that we're trained in as part of our disciplines. So our hope as we engage with some of these techniques that are going to show up on the slides is that we want to put this technology in the service of some pretty traditional, you know, deeply considered engagement with texts and images and, and all sorts of things, music and art, but that we want to uh, take advantage of the technology that's changing and letting us do different kinds of reading. And really that leads to the third point, which is the notion of using technology to surface what is hidden, surface what is latent inside archives at scale. And by archives at scale, I don't mean the type of work that was done in the 1990s, putting Shakespeare on a CD-ROM. That's very important. It's really crucial that we have a corpus of Shakespeare. But we don't have, um, you know, that's a very different project than everything ever printed in Elizabethan England. So that context from, uh, from the kind of uh, large amount of human culture that's being digitized uh, and of being able to think about that in ways that are disciplinarily relevant, that don't contradict but rather engage with our own traditions that we learn from our advisors, and still to be able to use these algorithms to do the close reading to find what's hidden inside these enormous digital databases that I think most of us are aware of, even if we don't engage with them every day. And the reason I put these three um, ideas on the, on the slide here is because that is a common problem that people come to us with at Yale. They say, I'm interested in doing digital humanities work, but I need to know what it is. And what, is it a department? Is it a discipline? What do you think? Um, of course, we're not really interested in, we're more interested in turning that question around on our clients and figuring out what it means to them. But certainly what we try to do in the lab 
on campus is we try to help with the analysis and the visualization and the engagement of humanities data in pursuit of humanistic questions. And I actually think the last part of this definition is the most important, because you will undoubtedly find people on campus who are looking at historical material. You'll find computational linguists or corpus linguists who are working with old newspapers, uh, but they're answering corpus linguistics questions. They're not necessarily always answering questions which are legible or meaningful to an English professor or an English graduate student. So I think that's important that although we uh, operate very similarly to disciplines which have been doing text and data mining for a long time, there are going to be unique characteristics to the French department at Yale or the Complet department in Uppsala that characterize the disciplinarily meaningful questions that might emerge. Um, we tend to work in the lab across textual and visual network analysis and geospatial. Today I'm focusing on the first of these, textual and visual analysis. So let's just jump into textual analysis. I think the, the thing I want to preface this with is, of course, that thinking about corpora is not new. Roberta Busa was thinking about an electronic corpus when he input Thomas Aquinas into a mainframe in the 1950s. Um, and this, of course, goes back to monastic scribal practice of the biblical concordance in the 12th century. So there's a long genealogy of atomizing words, counting them, thinking about where do they occur in, in the Bible or in other really important texts. And usually, at least in the 1990s, you ended up with something like this. So this is the wild duck, and I've looked for the word the wild duck, and I get every instance of the wild duck. And this is a truly meaningful way, I think. It's a way of kind of um, thinking about Ibsen's work in a certain axis that we, don't, we couldn't do without a computer. I mean, you could highlight every instance of the wild duck in a book. But it's much nicer to get the results in a kind of keyword and context result like you see on the screen here. But really what we need to do is we need to move beyond keyword search. We need to move beyond the notion that you're going to put one word into a search engine and get every result of that word. So the question is, well, what does it mean to move beyond keyword search? So I think what I want to talk about today on the textual side is maybe five or six different approaches. And some of these will probably be familiar to you. You've maybe seen these um, buzzwords in MLA papers or in conferences. If you've been to a digital humanities conference or if you're a practitioner yourself, you might have heard of topic modeling. Um, but I just want to go there through them really quickly and talk about each in the context of a concrete project and sort of suggest how it moves beyond simple keyword search, help the, how it helps answer humanistic questions, and how it helps surface latent patterns in large databases. So let's start off with um, n-gram search. Now, I think the way I want to demo this is actually um, live. Let's we'll see what can happen here. And you're going to have to excuse me because I'm going to deal with a non-literary corpus. I'm going to not deal with high literature for a moment. I'm going to deal with an enormous collection of text from an American fashion magazine, which is the magazine Vogue. And Vogue was first published in the 1890s. And if you, we actually have two or three full runs of Vogue magazine at Yale Library. It's 400,000 pages. So if you read that, you can. People have pulled it, and you can read it. But if you think you can remember what's on page one by the time you finish page 400,000, you're a much better close reader than I am. So what we want to do instead is put software affordances. We want to put technology on top of the corpus. And one of those things we can do is n-gram search, which is most famous um, with the Google Books n-gram search tool, which launched around 2010. That's on top of Google Books. But this software is on top of the American fashion magazine Vogue. And so what we've done here is we've looked at patterns in three adjectives. The English adjective lovely, pretty, and sexy. So the orange here is the word pretty, which is very prevalent around the year 1900. And we have the a blue here, which is lovely. And then at the very bottom, the green is the word sexy. So just to talk a little bit about our axes, we have time on the bottom. So we're going from 1892 on my far left all the way to 2013 on the right. And then the y-axis is actually a little bit of math. It's the normalized words per million. And the reason we have that in there is because we, of course, there are different numbers of articles and different numbers of pages published every year. So you can't just count the number of times sexy appears. You have to count it and then divide by the total number of words every year. And that's what this does. So of course, the immediate observation is that people didn't use the word sexy until around the 1960s. It doesn't occur until that point. If you were curious about a moment when it seems to peak, um, what I could do is I could click on this and I'd be able to go in and um, read an article about Bianca Jagger, apparently. And what I'm doing here is I'm leaving the Yale server and I'm going to the ProQuest server. ProQuest is a for-profit company that sells materials to libraries. 
Um, we don't store any copyrighted material at Yale. We refer to the vendor's server. As you could imagine, Pro, uh, Vogue is both under copyright and under license, so it's a very complicated thing to work in. But one of the reasons we built this website is we believe that humanists should have the same rights to licensed and in, in copyright information as they do with physical books on the shelf. And we should have the same tools and even better tools to be able to work with them. So here's a way to sort of do the close reading of the word sexy at this moment. But let's return and just show you that this is an actual tool that lives and breathes. I don't have to just ask questions about the word sexy. I could look for two collective nouns. So I could look for the word women, and I could look for the word girls in this corpus. And the answer I get um, would, I think, show me something sort of interesting. So now we have uh, blue is women and orange is girls. Now, remember, we have time on the x-axis, and we have normalized words per million on the y-axis. Um, another thing you might be able to see is that we're trying to do some very light color banding around certain eras, and these are eras of editors. And so around 1970, there's an editor switch at Vogue away from Diana Vreeland and towards Grace Mirabella. It's, of course, also a, a bigger moment in history when there's a feminist discourse and people are changing the words they use to refer to women, but the obvious takeaway here is that something changes around 1970. People stop using the word girls as frequently, and they start using the word women. There's also a more subtle pattern here, which is that girls and women are only really occurring at the same rate after about 1915. Before that time period, girls are much, used much less frequently. And I can tell you from having looked at this that the reason why is that if you click on some of these articles from the early 20th century, 1901, you're actually basically looking at small, I mean, these are girls under the age of 13. So the implication is that this pattern is showing you when girls became slang for women and when it stopped being acceptable to use girls as a synonym for women. Um, you could tease this out in a lot of different ways. You could write a traditional paper by doing a close reading of all these different articles, but you'd get to that close reading by seeing this pattern on the screen. So that's n-gram search. It only works in very certain cases where you have uh, very finely tagged dates. So the reason a magazine works so well is the magazine actually in these decades it was coming out every week, and nowadays it's a monthly. But unlike a modernist novel with a uh, fashion magazine, we know exactly when things are happening in time, and that lends itself very well to this type of tool. So that's Ngram search, and certainly a thing that we think should be applied to a lot more collections than just fashion magazines. We think it's a really exciting interface. The flaw, though, the flaw in this tool is that I had to think of that research question. I had to say, well, when did girls start being used and when did women start being used? And I had to use my own domain expertise of what English language was like to think of these two words. I didn't think of the word ladies. I didn't think of babes. I didn't think of all sorts of other things that I probably should look at. Because this is still a corpus query model. It's a keyword search model. It has some nice affordances for time. It has color coding, it lets you show how things rise and fall, but it's still dependent on the limitations of myself as a researcher for thinking that I know what women were called. And although that may be true in 2010, it's probably not true in 1910. I probably didn't know those words. So this actually leads us into the second technique I want us to consider, and that is topic modeling. The topic modeling is something that's very exciting in the digital humanities over the past six or seven years. Um, people will definitely mention it to you. It's one of these things, if you get interested in the digital humanities, people like to talk about topic modeling. And it's one of these things that's both simultaneously very useful and also incredibly difficult to explain because it does rely on some really complicated math behind the scenes. Topic modeling is something that emerges out of statistics and applied math. And that means that there's some incredibly complicated stuff going on the scene, behind the scenes, that's very difficult to explain, at least very difficult for me to explain. It has that reputation of being a kind of black box algorithm, that we get really interesting results out of it, but we're not 100% confident how it works. Now, computer scientists are confident how it works. It's just like explaining it in language that I can understand is difficult. So with that caveat, let me just show you another example. And for this, I'm actually going to use the same corpus. I'm going to use this collection of Vogue. And in this case, I'm going to take about 100,000 articles. So not the ads, but 100,000 journalistic articles that have been published in Vogue. And what I've asked the topic modeling to, algorithm to do is to think about these articles as if they were contained in 20 categories, or as if the entire corpus 
participated in 20 topics, 20 discourses. That's one of the fundamental things you do with topic modeling, is you ask the algorithm to analyze your large collection and split it up into 20 or 50 or 10 categories. And the math behind topic modeling tries to find these thematic categories, these topics, not by understanding English and not by having any understanding of women's fashion, but rather by measuring the term co-occurrence, the notion of knowing a word by the company it keeps. It's one of these Bayesian inference algorithms, so it assumes that initially Vogue could have been written randomly, and then it makes observations that certain words don't occur around each other in random distributions. That in fact, uh, words might occur around each other far more commonly than a random distribution would predict. And one example here is the first of 20 topics that's on the screen. It's important, I'm gonna show you 19 more, but I wanna start with this one. I think it's pretty easy to understand <coughs> The computer does not understand the word art, painting, exhibition. It doesn't know English, but it knows that words like art, painting, exhibition co-occur around each other far more commonly than a random distribution would suggest. What I'm showing you on the left here, the words in red, are just the single words, and then over here on the right are the phrases. Those phrases have had um, sort of adjectives and, and uh, definites taken out, so they're going to look a little cryptic but this is probably Muse Metropolitan Museum of Art, of Art. Computers don't know what these 20 topics are, but they know that they exist. So we as humans have labeled this topic art, unsurprisingly. Um, I've shown you a couple words, but these are not the only words that make up this topic. This topic of art is actually technically a probability distribution over every word in the English language. It's just that art is the most probable word for this topic. So it's way more powerful than me looking for the word museum or art in the corpus using an engram tool that we just saw. It's actually as if every single word exerted an influence on this discourse, but these were the ones that were the most powerful. And if I click into a particular year, here I've clicked into 1969, and on the far right-hand side of the screen, what I'm showing you are the articles that are the most saturated with the art topic. Um, so a couple things to note. First of all, would I have thought that there's an art topic in Vogue? Would I have known to look for art articles in Vogue? Maybe, but it may not have been one of the things I thought of normally when I have a fashion magazine. Is this just junk data? Is it false? Well, probably not if Barbara Rose is publishing in Vogue, a well-known art historian. So let's click through to um, one of the articles that Barbara Rose found. And I just think this one is about um, Robert Motherwell. So here we go, an actual art historical article in Vogue magazine, Openness and Robert Motherwell, The Infallible Eye, Abstract Expressionism, blah, blah, blah. What we've sort of found here is a kind of virtual subject category, a kind of thematic division of Vogue. And we've only looked at one of these so far. There are 19 more that is not produced by a human and not produced by an algorithm that understands English. It's just based on an algorithm that can count words. So how do we know if this is working? Well, American women used to make their own clothing before the Second World War, and so there's this big topic of dressmaking and patterns before the Second World War, and, and it's characterized by material, price, skirt, patterns, sizes, things like that. Um, that's, again, an organizational category that um, emerges sort of organically from patterns hidden in the data. It's made up of articles like this. How do you cut out the pattern in order to make the dress? Um, another example uh, here, well, there's definitely a discourse on food, uh, butter, water, cream, things like that. Again, the, there are all these recipes in Vogue. You wouldn't really have thought to look for it and you can click through to them. But the one I want to go to, I want to go down to this one, which we've labeled women's health. It's characterized by words like women, exercise, health, body, cancer, doctor. And you'll see there's a very peculiar distribution of this topic over time. Now, this graph here, which does relate to women's health, it is superficially similar to what we saw before with the n-grams going up and down over time, but it's actually far more powerful. It's not looking for the word health. It's looking for every single word in the corpus, but most focused on women, body, exercise, health, and all the way down the line in descending order. So what you're getting is not the measurement of one word, like health or cancer, but rather a measurement of a discourse that's rising and falling inside the corpus. The women's health discourse begins in the 1960s, but really reaches its peak under Grace Mirabella. For those of you who don't know, Grace Mirabella was married to a physician, and she tried to get tobacco advertisement taken out of Vogue. That may have been one of the reasons why she was fired. 
At any rate, when Anna Wintour takes over, you notice there's a marked decrease in this women's health discourse. Now, what is this actually about? We can guess by looking at phrases like health and fitness, breast cancer, but the only real way to know for sure is to click into the pattern we see and do some close reading. So on the very far right of my screen, I'm looking at some of the articles about your brain and nervous system, the heart benefits of being female, why crash diets don't work. And I can tell you from having looked at this um, corpus that there are all sorts of interesting articles in here about contraception, about tanning, uh, about vitamins, about pregnancy. It's a kind of meta-discourse that is not dependent on one word, but is actually a kind of a representation of the entire all of the universe of words that are present in discourse about women's health. And I can sort of prove that to you by going way back in time, way before the 1960s and 70s, and before people started talking about this stuff. And I like this article in 1910, How to Reduce Weight Judiciously. I mean, this is really the 1910 language of dieting, diet pills, and things like that that we see in the 1970s, right? It's just using the language of the 1990, uh, the, excuse me, the, 18, the 1910s. Um, if you go further into the really early health discourse, you get articles about tuberculosis, because that is the discourse then. The word tuberculosis does not occur in the 1990s, but the same constellation of concerns, the same topic that's been modeled by this algorithm does occur. And so that's topic modeling. We have a postdoc in the lab who um, recently completed his work, and his work was very much around another idea in text analysis, and it really had to do with the relationship between space and text, between maps and narrative. This is um, John Schroeder, who just actually got a job in the UK and uh, focused on digital humanities. Um, he's an English guy from Chicago. So what he did was he worked on slave narratives from the American experience. And what he did was he thought differently about text. He said, well, I'm reading all of these slave narratives of African Americans who chronicle how they escaped bondage. And generally, that's by going north. They leave where they are in the south, and they make an escape on the Underground Railroad or on their own means northwards. And so John wanted to think about text spatially. And so what he did with us, as in part of his year inside the lab, was he built this website called Passages to Freedom. And let me just make this a little bigger so you can see it. What we've got on the left is all sorts of slave narratives. These are all out of copyright, so we've scanned them and put them in. Um, Frederick Douglass, pretty well known, but there's other ones too. Um, and let me just pull into one of these here. And so well, that starts all the way over in Africa. Let's see if we can get something in the North American continent. So what you're seeing is um, my birthplace was on the Eastern Shore, and then I'd go to Washington County, um, and then what's the distance to Baltimore? Uh, we go to Riser Town. So what we're seeing here is basically a map that's linked to a text. This was done not with an algorithm, but with John reading this text and marking it up with these locations. And so every time I'm curious about uh, East Nant Meal or, uh, you know, what are we here, Philadelphia, other places, I can see this relationship between the map and the text. And if I want to go ahead and do that close reading, I can do that and see where that occurs in the text. This is more of an interface uh, than an algorithm. But I think it's kind of an interesting, oh, it's New Haven where I work. So I think it's kind of an interesting uh, way of thinking about maps and text that isn't really, um, it's not like automatically discovering these, it's just a scholar who really cares about the relationship between place and text, building an interface that anyone can browse in order to kind of make sense of how people escape bondage and what were the places that were meaningful for them over time. So that's the spatialization of text. And the next thing I want to talk about swings back towards algorithms. Um, and this has to do with moments of intertextuality. Um, and intertextuality in, in between texts is, of course, a, a euphemism. Textual reuse covers all sorts of different moral um, valences that we put on textual reuse. It covers um, the citation that your undergraduates hopefully do when they quote a paper in a, in a paper. Um, it also can, if they happen to copy and paste from Wikipedia without telling you, that's another uh, example of intertextuality. Um, and then there's, of course, allusion and paraphrase and all sorts of things. And as our electronic text collections get bigger, as we go over 30 million books in Google Books, or 900 texts in Literaturbanken out of Gothenburg, um, as Bukhila.no in Norway has put in everything ever written in Norwegian, 
I think we have a kind of obligation to think differently about these texts, to move beyond that kind of keyword search of looking for the wild duck, and towards these places in the text that we may not expect connections. Because although we're probably familiar with the most famous lines in Shakespeare, we actually don't know who quoted what parts of Shakespeare most often. We can say, I'm going to look for the phrase, something is rotten in the state of Denmark, but there may be other parts of Shakespeare quoted in the 19th century that aren't quoted anymore that I just don't know. So what we're working on doing is building tools around this notion of unexpected intertextuality. And one example of um, unexpected intertextuality is on the screen here. Um, this is a little small, but I'll help you guys read it. This is, uh, let's just say, a moment of borrowing between 1840 <laughs> and 1900. Um, folks probably know Krusenstolpe, Carl Benson translated a whole bunch of detective fiction. He's a, none of these people are unknown. You can find them um, in reference works. But strangely, what's going on um, 60 years after Krusenstolpe publishes his, histori his, sort of, uh, his historic novel of the Gustavian period is that Carl Benson just loots page after page of, and in his own book. Um, it's not a pirate edition. It's not him. Uh, it's not, a, not bad metadata. And it's not the whole thing. It's just certain pages. Every so often, he's like razored out of Krusenstolpe and pasted into his own book. Um, and some of this is shown on the screen. Um, and so, uh, what we're going to show this a little. This is a funny example. Kledsen von Tarlig. Kledsen von Nest und von Kaller Tarlig. So he's changing it a little bit, but not enough, right? He would still get an F. He would flunk if he tried to do this. Um, let's see this a little closer, maybe, in this browser. So, of course, um, part of what's going on here is that um, both works refer to Belmont, and so if I'm interested in this, I can say, well, what are the moments, I mean, that's not the only moment of plagiarism. Uh, the the Belmont is, is understandable, but the, the Krusenstolp is not, uh, in terms of what Carl did. But here's um, Carl Benson quoting um, Belmont, and so we can see, like, from this particular letter, we can read that letter, number 22, due to our friends at Runeberg, and then if I want to say what's going on here, I click this button and I go to Matt's mom server, and I can read that, co that um, context down here in terms of how uh, that Bellman song is reoccurring. Again, this is just the beginnings of this software, um, but we're really excited about it. My vision would be to um, be able to have this built on top of Literaturbanken um, and also um, uh, what is it, Archiv for Dance Literatur in Denmark, just to be able to build this on top of it, to be able to see um, who's quoting Brandes as we go on um, in, in time. All right, so that's intertextuality. Um, let's switch over to ah, the la second to last thing, I think. Um, has anybody ever heard in this room ever heard of word embedding models or vector space models for texts? That's great. That's good. Because um, it's really hard to explain. Um, this is something <laughs> that is um, really exciting and just beginning to be worked on by some digital humanists across the world. Um, but there are two Americans, I think, who are doing very good work. I'm going to show some one of those two people's work. It's um, it's very complicated, and it is it just it's like the topic modeling of today in the sense that it's almost impossible to explain. But the notion with you'll hear this described in two ways. You'll hear it described as word embedding models and vector space models. They're basically the same thing. But think of it as all the words in the Swedish language and every piece of literature ever written um, arranged in an imaginary space. And a space that doesn't have three dimensions, but that has hundreds of dimensions. So not just X, Y, Z, but like hundreds and hundreds of dimensions. So that words that, are, that mean similar things, at least as evidenced in certain textual witnesses, are close together in that high dimensional space. It's a spatialization in a different way than a map is. It's a spatialization in an imaginary space of semantics. Why would you ever map meaning into fake space? Because you can compute fake space very efficiently. In high dimensional space that you can't draw and you can't even imagine, algorithms are capable of finding things that are close to each other, as well as finding lines between things in high dimensional space very effectively. So Ben Schmidt, who's a professor of history at Northeastern in Boston, describes these techniques as efforts to encode the various relations between words into a spatial analog. Why would you ever do this? Um, to create a kind of discursive space that you can explore, and crucially ex explore according to the dichotomies or the axes that are meaningful to you as a researcher. 
So you don't have much control over the topics that emerge out of topic modeling. You can change the number that you return, whether you want 50 topics or 20 topics, but it's, it's hard to have control over topic modeling and say, I really need one theme about women and the other one about horses. With word embedding models or vector models, you have a lot more power to define arbitrary lines in this space that represent questions that you have about your text. And one of the scholars who's done this very well is a graduate student at Stanford, Ryan Heuser. Now, Ryan works on abstract values in the 18th century. And there are actually some reasons why I think the 18th century obsession with abstract values happens to work very well with um, these, this particular technique. But I uh, totally encourage you to look at Ryan Heuser's website. It's just like ryanheuser.org. And um, it's, his subsite is the, the, the area of his website that he talks about. This is called Word Vectors in the 18th Century. And he does a great job, far better than I can, about explaining why this technique is meaningful to 18th centuryists. But he talks about these sort of, these cultural semantic debates in the 18th century between the ancients and the moderns, simplicity and refinement, blah, blah, blah. And um, on the screen here, it's just not expected to read this, but I just want to give you an example of what a, a diagram that comes from this research looks like, is a dichotomy, is a tension field between negatively valued val uh, abst uh, abstract values on the left and positively valued things on the right. So you have things like reproof and ashamed and corrupted on the left and corruptible, um, guilt guilty, things like that, wanton. And on the far right, you have words like righteous and agreeable and humble and uh, unassuming. And these are all, all of the words in Echo, which is 18th century collections online, arranged in an imaginary space where we've put the negatively va valenced ones on the left and the positively valenced ones on the right. This is the first visualization I'm going to show you, but I'm going to show you a couple more. Um, Ryan goes further and tries to not just place these words in these kind of two-dimensional representations of high-dimensional space, but he tries to draw lines between them according to how close they are to other words in this very high-dimensional space. In this image, which is two dimensions, I can only put things close to each other in, in sort of one dimension, right? But in a high-dimensional space, Words are connected to each other through many different methods. And that's what this network diagram is trying to show you. So let's look at an example of that. Um, these are an example of ugly thoughts towards others that Ryan has identified in all of 18th century collections online, all of Echo. So this has to do with words like resentment and prejudice and censure, and also words like partiality. The clustering is because they're all close to each other, but the fact that words like partiality are over in another part of the, of the cloud has to do with the, mul the multiple kinds of connections, only some of which can be represented in two dimensions. This uh, work that Ryan does is really in the hundreds of dimensions, and so we are limited to how we can show this, and the network is an attempt to show you more than two dimensions can. So here's a cluster. Think of this as a galaxy. And here's a, I don't know, some sort of solar system of ugly thoughts towards others. And here's the ugly thoughts towards self, which has to do with words like anguish, disappointment, anxiety, misery, more inward directed, whereas these are towards others, partiality, prejudice, censure, and resentment. So again, this is his own reading of these clusters. The clusters do emerge um, algorithmically through a particular technique for identifying clusters. But it's an English graduate student's understanding of abstract values in the 18th century, which is lending these labels, the notion of yourself and others, and how ugly thoughts are expressed. I really encourage you to look at Ryan Heuser's work. He's got so many more images than this. He explains it so much better than I could. But I thought what we could do next is just think about um, Literaturbanken, which is about, when I was doing this work, it was almost 900 texts. Um, put together out of Gothenburg with really important partnerships with things like the National Edition of Strindberg and all sorts of other literary societies. So it has its origins in this high literature, but aspirations to put in uh, really everything else that's ever been published in Swedish. When I was working with this stuff, it was about 837 texts, about 33 million words. And it, for those of you, maybe only one in the room, who've read about word embedding models or vector space models before, a lot of the excitement came out of a paper that Google published three, four years ago. And in this paper, Google took like everything ever published in English, because that's what Google has, and used these high dimensional spaces that are technically an embedding of an even higher dimensional space, 
in order to see if these word embedding models could make a simple analogy. Without knowing English and without knowing about the history of royalty, they asked this model of English, if you take the word king and you subtract the male direction from king and you go in the female direction, remember we can go in hundreds of directions. It's not just left, right, up, down. It's many, many dimensions. Where do you go in this semantic space? Where do you end up in this imaginary space? Start with king, go away from men, and go towards women. And the answer was queen. Now remember, the computer doesn't understand English. It doesn't know the history of those words. It just knows that's where you land. So I was curious with Literaturbank, could we replicate that? Um, we basically can. I should mention that like Google has 30 million texts, and we have 837, so it's not going to get as good results as Google. But if we take Dropning and we subtract um, Kvina, and we add Mon, then we get Kung, Kron, Prince, Konung, blah, blah, blah. It goes further on there. We basically get male words for royalty. And the reverse basically works. If we take Kung, and we subtract Mon, and we add Kvina, we get Drotning, and then we get some other female words down there, Princessa, you know, uh, Duchess, or whatever. This is impacted by how many works in Literaturbankan are actually about royalty, right? It would probably work much better if we had the court records, but it does basically show you this is working. Um, but what I was interested in doing was going further and saying, okay, we can sort of replicate that parallelism. But I said, the other thing that this imaginary space can do is it can try to find similarities, things that are closer to, to uh, other items than, other than all the rest of the items. And that notion of similarity can be used to build these types of family trees, like I put on the screen. The only interesting part is low here, and I know it may be hard to see, so I'm going to read some of these words. These are basically food words in the literature bank. And so I'll just go here that we have things like um, chocolate pretty close together. Um, we have um, chocolate, grede, and milk, and socker. I'm happy with that. Um, we have smur and ost, our siblings. Um, and then, of course, you have to remember there are many relationships in this database, only some of which are material. So if you go to the very far uh, side of the screen, you have öl and siu. So I actually think this is sort of defensible, because it, it's the context of like eating things together, right? You might expect öl to be close to other beverages and fish to be, uh, you know, herring to be close to other fishes, but it would sort of make sense if those are, those are occurring in the same context. So let's go further and let's think about, I promised you before that one of the things word embedding models or vector space models were going to let us do was to think about our own research questions. Not the topics that a topic model comes up with, but the things that motivate us to do our research. And so um, I've tried to do this a little bit with an example out of the literature bank. I'm interested in economic terms, words for economic relationships. Now, one of the interesting things about working with word embedding models is you yourself don't have to think of all these words. Um, just like the whole problem of do I know the right words for women or girls or whatever, you can start with a word like Arbeitskraft, and then you can ask this high-dimensional model to find the nearest neighbors, find the things that are around it in this imaginary space. And it would probably say that Arbeitskraft is really close, and Fachverening, and Streik, and things like that. So these 300 words, I put a couple dozen on the screen, but they're actually 300 words for labor relations in the literature bank. I started with, I think, you know, uh, labor, Arbeitskraft, and then I went more to get more. And then, given this subset of words, I tried to define two dichotomies or vectors, two arbitrary cor uh, sort, of, um, sort of contradictions or spectra. So I took the um, gender spectrum of male versus female, and I took, uh, I played around a lot with this. I was basically trying to find rural and urban, and that didn't work so great because it's not, I couldn't think of the right word for urban. Um, so I instead decided to do ind industry versus agriculture as my proxy for that. I should say that sometimes you have to work around some hiccups. So um, you can't just say mon lakina because mon is, you know, the polysemy of mon won't really work. So what you do, it's okay. Instead of tying a piece of string, what you're really doing is tying a piece of string around the words man and women. But what you can do is instead tie a piece of string between man and han, and then pull that string all the way to kina and hun. It doesn't matter how many you put in that cluster. You're still creating an arbitrary line, an arbitrary vector in this high dimensional space. So what happens? Well. You get this. Nobody can read this, don't worry, I'll explain it. What you're getting is 
Words that on the far left have to do with industry, industry, and on the far right have to do with agriculture. And gender is top to bottom, so men is in the top, that's like the, the constellation of, of man and han, and female is at the bottom. Now the first thing you see is, geez, a lot more about men than there is about women, and that actually matches what you kind of expect in literature banking. So what I need to do now is I need to zoom us in into this corner. I need to take you to the top right, because that's going to be the agricultural and the male corner. So let's zoom in there. And what you get are a whole bunch of interesting words that are coded or that are, have a valence of being more towards male than women and more towards agriculture than, uh, than, uh, excuse me, yeah, than industry. Uh, it's hard to read, so I'll just put these words on the screen. But there are uh, words like expropriate, plot of land, hygiene, uneconomic, grain, agricultural. These are the male agricultural words understood on that dichotomy between gender and uh, transforming a labor state. We can also go back to the screen and look at all of the stuff below the midpoint. Anything below the midpoint or close to the midpoint, because this is a pretty biased corpus, is more associated with women than with men. And so I know that the Rustreth is in here, and Egg and the There's definitely home labor, healthcare, labor market, morality, law. Um, all of these things are coded more female than they are male. This is just a small example. Um, what's intriguing about vector space models is that they work much better if you have more data. So if we were to throw in historic newspapers into this, the patterns would be probably very clear. Um, if you were to um, extend beyond where the literature bank stops, you'd probably get even better results. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that what characterizes digital humanities in the current moment is really about the engagement with scale. And so it requires a whole shift in our thinking about you know, is 837 books enough? No, we really like 8,000 books, and then this result would be even more exciting, I think. So this is just a quick review of what we've covered. We've talked about n-gram search, which, as I explained, it was basically just using time as a visualization axis to understand how words that you already know how to search for change over time. We've talked about topic modeling, which is letting discourses that are latent inside the corpus, at least as defined by the frequency of term co-occurrence, bubble to the surface and let you have an incredibly powerful magnifying glass on what's going on behind the scenes. We've talked about um, the first form of spatialization, which is just putting places on maps and seeing how narratives take us through uh, space. We've talked about uh, intertextuality, which is about thinking of um, hitherto hidden connections between texts where we have citation, plagiarism, allusion, and other forms of intertextuality. And finally, we've talked about these really complicated word embedding models, which are still very nascent in their use. We're still evolving the best practices around these. But I think there's really exciting work going on by Ben Schmidt and Ryan Heuser, respectively, um, in thinking about these and figuring out how they can be used to solve the particular problems that humanists have, because we allow them folks to define researcher-defined dichotomies. Now with that, I want to switch gears quickly and just talk about um, the visual. I think for, as that image of, um, of Roberta Busa suggested, people have been working with words for a long time, and computers have been capable of handling words since the 1940s. It's only really recently that folks have had the computational power to handle images. And that leads us to a moment where we're able to kind of consider what we might term visual culture computation as an emerging front in the digital humanities. So I want to just blow through some examples really quickly here of some work we're doing at Yale around the problem of algorithmic analysis of visual culture. So let's just get started. Um, we're going to return to my fashion magazine example here. And I think what I want to do is um, just show you an example of some work we did. Um, covers are a very interesting part of uh, a magazine because they are indexical. They represent what's going on in that magazine you know, visually and, and textually. What we've done here is we've just taken covers from every decade and we've overlaid those covers as if they were, um, you know, these kind of transparencies on the old projectors, remember? So basically everything is, is uh, imagine a strong light shining through transparent plastic. The obvious pattern here is what the heck is going on in 1970 and 1980. What's going on is, visual, is visually you're stuck in a rut. Every single woman on the cover is like the same pose. Um, this is an anti-pattern where you see this, they're stuck. 
In the 1940s and 50s, um, you see no pattern because every single cover was a work of art. Some of them were designed by Salvador Dali. And so that's just um, it's true. Uh, so uh, this is what uh, a lot of the um, covers looked like in, the, in that era. They were, everything is unique. Um, whereas here, um, in this particular era, they all look the same. But that was basically done by hand, so what can we do to go a little further? What can we um, do to sort of try to show some patterns that are coming out here? Well, one simple way is just to measure the colorness of um, each uh, cover over time. So what maybe I'll do is make this full screen. And what I'm doing here is I have a graph, and the graph on the x-axis is time. So we're starting around 1910. That's when Vogue covers begin to be color. Um, and then we're stopping around 2010s, and each cover is actually in its place. That is to say, you can see each cover if you zoom in far enough. What is the y-axis? Well, the y-axis is measuring the saturation, or the amount of color in each cover. And what I want to focus your eye on is this moment in the 1970s, in 1980s, where the covers get really colorful. There's basically nothing that's less than that colorful. And that's actually um, exactly the time that um, some of the covers were uh, getting, uh, we, we saw that earlier, where some of these covers were really uh, incredibly saturated. This is what they look like in that decade. Incredible, I mean, printing technology is getting better, they can represent color much better, but we can see this is the kind of distant reading of that moment, right? This is this moment where the, the color just shoots way up and doesn't get unsaturated. Now that's a kind of cool technique, but of course the limitation is we're measuring the mean saturation of the images. That's a very, um, very clunky, not very uh, uh, fine-tuned uh, way of thinking about stuff. So what we could do instead is we could think about, instead of uh, measuring the mean saturation of every single cover, we could take every cover and we could cut it into hundreds of pieces of confetti, just slice them all up. And then we could measure the color of each individual teeny piece that's left. And then we could show that every year. So in the top right-hand corner, you're seeing the years that are going on here. And what we can do is we can see there's a difference between 1906 and later on. So let's talk about our axes. Our axes here are twofold. We have saturation on the X. So X is to the left is not very much color, and to the right is a lot of color. And then Y, the vertical axis, is light to dark. So what we're trying to show here is there's a substantial difference between 1961, hundreds of pieces of covers cut into confetti measured on saturation and lightness, versus 1979. By the time this happens 18 years later, they can produce a lot more color, and that's why it's far to the right on this spectrum. The other intriguing thing about this visualization strategy is that although all these covers are under copyright of the photographer and of Condé Nast, I can still show you this because I'm not reproducing the covers. I've cut them up into hundreds of bits and they don't violate copyright. So that's pretty exciting. <laughs> the other thing we can do is we can think about extracting discrete colors from the covers using a, a basically a data mining technique called um, k-means analysis. What k-means is one of these terms that we get from statistics. What k-means means is it's just basically asking for a certain number of colors from each cover. In this case, I think we asked for five or seven covers, uh, colors from each cover. And so it's banding together all the red and putting it in a box and calling that red, even though it's actually variegated. But what it allows us to do is to build an interface like this, where if I move my mouse over a particular um, color, I get all of the covers that have that color in them ordered by the number, the amount of color. So here I'm looking at the reddest cover is here and then declining. Um, and if I move my mouse over to this um, pink, I get pink, I get blue here. Um, so this is based, again, on algorithmic analysis of the covers, and it's just a way of kind of letting you surf by color um, rather than having to, uh, to look for the word pink or blue, which, of course, would be completely ineffective. It's a visual browser for some of the color metric aspects of the images themselves. Um, that's exciting, but really all we've done so far is use math to measure the RGB values of these images. And we haven't really gone very much more sophisticated than that. And so recently our Rare Books Library acquired a really special collection of, photo of, of historic photography. This photography came from a private family, so it's called the Meserve Kuhnhart Collection. It's famous as a collection of the United States Civil War. But it really extends beyond that. It goes from the 1860s to the 1890s. So it covers the American Civil War through the Gilded Age. 
And it's just in the process of being digitized. I only have 27,000 out of the entire 73,000 that I can work with. But what we wanted to do was we couldn't really measure color because this is all like black and white or sepia toned. Um, we didn't have great dates, so we couldn't do one of those charts where things go up and down over time. So we were interested in what we could do with this collection of 19th century American photography. What could we use from the sort of toolbox of algorithms that might build a really interesting experiment on top of this collection of cultural heritage? And so let me just show you quickly what we did. What we did was we thought about the collection holistically, and we said, man, even with 27,000 pictures, if you sit there in a rare books library and you try to look at every single picture, your head is going to be swimming. It's going to be really difficult for you to memorize the kind of visual tropes, the kind of ways that people were posed, the ways that women's hair looked and that Confederate army uniforms looked like. And we said, wouldn't it be nice if you were just able to look at some random number of pictures um, on a website, and when you moved your mouse over each particular picture, you got images that were visually similar to the image you moved your mouse over. So what this means is that when I move my mouse over this picture of a building, um, I get other images, in, case, in this case, perhaps some reprints um, of that particular image. And when I move my mouse over a general sitting like this, I get more. When I move my mouse over an image like this, I get um, a, a fellow who looks very similar. And these are all women in these very long gowns. Now, every time I reload the page, I'm basically just getting a, a separate, uh, random scattering of these pictures. There's no meaning, really, to what I start with. But there is meaning to what occurs when I move my mouse over this vignetted picture. We get images that are visually similar to what I've moved my mouse over. So, and this is probably true of even some of the more weird things, like these collections of, uh, of circles. Um, everything that's visually similar to that comes up. If I move my mouse over a, a landscape with a house, I get more houses. Um, probably I can guarantee there'll be horses if I move my mouse over this. So, how did we do this? Um, the way we did this was to use uh, artificial vision. Let me make this a little bigger because it has a little description here of what we're doing up top. There are neural networks, which are, which are artificial brains, or in this case, artificial vision systems that run um, on Facebook and on Google. And they run on your phone. They run on your Android phone, they run on your iPhone. What these systems are doing is they're trying to caption images. They're trying to describe images. So if you take out a modern iPhone or an Android phone and you go to your photographs, and if you say, I'm interested in the word cat, even though you've never labeled your pictures, you've never typed in the word cat to describe your pictures, what you'll get is all the pictures you've ever taken of a cat. These were labeled by a neural network, which is basically a learning system that sees tens of millions of pictures of cats and learns that that's what they look like, and does the same thing for dogs and lattes and all sorts of stuff. The problem, of course, is that the categories of the modern uh, neural network capturing systems are not optimized for the 19th century. There are actually very few pictures of cats inside the Missouri Coonhart collection because the picture was, took 15 seconds right, to expose and the cat would move by the time you're done. Um, and they, people didn't take pictures of latte art the way they do today. So we knew that the, it would be pointless to try to apply a captioning neural network to, provide, to try to do that, it would be anachronistic to try to label these pictures with 21st century categories. What they really have are things like sashes and brass buttons and Model Ts and people on horses. So how can we use the power of these modern captioning networks designed to do something totally different than what we want and make them useful for visual image search? And the answer is because these neural networks exist kind of as a series of layers, just like in your brain, when neurons fire, the first thing that happens when you see is you see very small lines. And then you see curves, and then you see shades, and eventually you recognize something as your uncle. <coughs> it's a hierarchy from the very simple to the very complex. And the final layer of your brain, considered as a neural network, is that same neural network that captions something on your phone. It decides uncle, cat, latte, dog. And it gives you sort of confidence about what you're looking at. So if we could step back from the final layer of this neural network, if we could discard the final decision that this is a cat or a dog or a, a latte from Wayne's Coffee, if we could take the penultimate layer, the layer that's just before that captioning layer, what we have is actually, again, a high-dimensional space. We have about 2,048 dimensions. 
And in this case, they are ways of seeing. They're very abstract ways of seeing that are the layer before cat versus dog. So maybe they're reacting to um, brass buttons here or light areas of circles all in a line. It doesn't matter, really. There's probably another two, one of the 2048 visual dimensions which is reacting to ovals. It's like a neuron in your brain firing whenever it sees ovals. And there's probably some layer here that's reacting to four-legged things with long necks. It doesn't matter what these layers are because what it matters is that we can take these more abstract ways of seeing and we can find the nearest neighbors in this 2048 dimensional space of this image, which turns out to be in the first case a reprint of the original picture, but then is more people standing like that. So they're ordered, ordered by similarity, and this is basically exactly what you'd expect if you take abstract ways of seeing and ask for the nearest neighbors in 2048 dimensions. An impossible task to draw on paper, an impossible task to consider in your head, but incredibly possible when you have the power of modern computation. So where do we go with this? What it really allows you to do is it allows you to think about visual patterns in this corpus. It allows you to think about the way that um, men of the cloth were staged, right? These people, we don't even know who they are. We don't use the captions, although we do have captions. We don't use the captions to determine similarity. Men with swords, right? That's not a category, right? A librarian wouldn't necessarily categorize this as men with swords. But, um, but we are able to return things which are substantially similar when we do this. So we think of this as um, just kind of a way of letting you get access to an enormous amount of information um, by just surfing through what catches your eye. And then eventually you'll be able to click through and see these in the context of the Rare Books Library. Now, the next thing I want to show is related to this project, um, but a little different. I've been talking a lot about um, this kind of weird notion of high dimensional spaces. So we map these pictures into 2048 imag imaginary dimensions, and then we try to show you the things that are closest to them. But another thing we could do is we could try to directly visualize that high dimensional space on a regular computer screen. And in order to do that, we're going to have to collapse, we're going to have to reduce the dimensions of this high dimensional space down to two. And this is really the same problem that Darwin had when he's in, I don't know where, New Zealand, right, Australia, and he sees these flowers that nobody's ever seen in Europe before. And he says, I have got to take this flower back to London. I've got to show my friends that this bird of paradise is so special and so unique. But the only way that Darwin is going to get this flower back to the United Kingdom is to crush it. He has to basically dry it between the pages of a book. That's the only way it's going to survive this voyage. So Darwin has a problem, and there's a couple different solutions. The naive solution is to take the bird of paradise and just crush it and put it in your pocket. But then you get to London, and people say, what did you, why did you bring me this thing? It doesn't, look specific, it doesn't look special at all. If you're smart, you guys all know what a bird of paradise looks like, right? It's like a beak, right? If you're smart, you'll put that flower flat, and you'll preserve the most characteristic part of it, which is the mouth that looks like the mouth of a bird, right? Bird of paradise you'll destroy the width of the flower in order to preserve the flower's main dimension, which is its shape. That's a, uh, of the beak. That is a dimensionality reduction from three to two. Here, I need to show you a dimensionality reduction from 2048 to two. So we're losing a lot more dimensions, but we have an algorithm which is gonna try to preserve local clustering. What this means, it's gonna give us a kind of visualization of all the 2048 dimensions in a way that preserves the sort of local meaning. So what we're looking at here is a visualization that is meaningless globally, but is uh, significant locally. What that means is that all of these pictures over here of men with sort of dark coats, mainly military uniforms with brass buttons, this is a, a constellation. This is a part that coheres. It is more similar than the rest of the images comparatively. Whereas if I go down, <coughs> a little bit and find a different neighborhood. There's no significance to this neighborhood over here being down and to the left. That doesn't matter. But what does matter is that um, the characteristics of the images, um, people standing on plinths or something like that, or over here we have um, people in groups, these are more similar to the images than the ones up top. So what we have here is a kind of dimensionality reduction of these 2048 dimensional spaces um, into an artificially constrained but a kind of uh, a space that does carry local meaning.
And we think this is an interesting possibility for getting at the problem of scale in large visual archives, surfacing these neighborhoods of people who are posed similarly and that might be useful for a researcher, um, or at the very least, this might be like the beginning of a, of a kind of art project. So that's neural networks for visual similarity. I'll show you my favorite example here, which I've screenshotted because it's so fun. Um, these are 19th century pugilists. These are boxers, and it's the same interface. So I've moved my mouse over the guy on the bottom left, and what comes up at the top is everybody who looks like him. Um, and what people immediately notice, or should notice, is that this is far more sensitive to line than it is to tone. And this accounts for the fact that you have an African-American boxer third from the left. The race is invisible, what's meaningful is the posture, the posing. So we've talked about that, and uh, neural networks have reoccurred uh, throughout this talk, and we've sort of seen them used in a couple different ways. We've seen them used as a similarity tool, as a way of producing a high-dimensional space with abstract ways of seeing that we can use to find visually similar images. We've also seen them as to produce that kind of that constellation of everything at once in which local clusters are meaningfully similar. But, but there's another way we can use um, uh, neural networks, and that is to actually produce nightmares. So what we'd like to do now is to talk a little bit about um, generative adversarial networks, which are a brand new um, I uh, idea, or at least they've been implemented in ways that are very exciting now. Generative adversarial networks, you can think of them as two neural networks fighting one another and crucially learning from one another. So what I need you to do is to think about two neural networks. One is designed to forge, to create material where it never has existed before by observing tens of thousands of 19th century portraits. So we give this forging neural network all those images you saw, the men, the soldiers, the women. We say, take a look at these thousands of faces and then try to dream up a face that's never existed that is as close to the truth as you can. But the problem for the forger is that we have another neural network. This is a detective, and the detective is obsessed with determining the difference between realness and falseness. It looks at a forged picture and tries to see if it's real or not, and then it compares it to the ground truth. We only let the detective know the truth after it's made a decision. And when it gets it wrong, it goes back and looks at those tens of thousands of pictures again and tries to come up with new rules of what makes a 19th century face. When the forger gets it, when the forger is discovered by the detective, the forger has to go back and look at these pictures again and try to dream up faces that are more accurate. And each of them thus learns from the other. The forger learns from the detective, and the detective learns from the forger. The forger learns how to dream more accurately, and the detective learns how to be more discerning. And all of this happens thousands of times a second, and we run these for days and days and days. So the question is, what do you get? What we're seeing is a neural network dream of 19th century faces that have never existed, but that are good enough to fool a detective neural network, which has access to the actual Missouri Kunhart collection, the actual 19th century faces. So I promised this would engender nightmares because it is in the kind of uncanny valley. It's based on tens of thousands of real 19th century faces, but we asked an incredibly sophisticated algorithm to try to produce faces that have never existed. And the ones that are good enough to beat the detective are shown on the screen until the detective gets better and learns that it's fake. You can see that it's a kind of fascinating observation of all the ways that people were posed. And there are some things like the top right that I mean really look like medical experiments gone wrong. But all of these are along the path of two neural networks fighting with each other observing millions and millions of pixels and trying to dream up something that's uh, never been there before. Now, we talked about image similarity, we talked about visualization. This is really in the more uh, the realm of an art project. But um, although it's stunning to look at visually, I should say this is also being done with text. So if you feed this algorithm every work of science fiction in Swedish ever published, it could dream up a new novel. And the detective would try to tell, is this really a science fiction book or not? And if it got it wrong, then the, the forger would have to create a new science fiction work, and it would go on and on and on. So uh, it's not just visual. We can do this in the textual domain.
So just to review um, visual culture computation, we've talked about pulling color out of images, we've talked about averaging pixels in order to see patterns, we've talked about cutting covers up into thousands of pieces of confetti in order to get more granular measurements of color. We've talked about um, neural networks for image similarity. We've talked about reducing high dimensional spaces produced by neural networks in order to visualize them, to see the entire corpus as if it were spread off across a table, just scattered thousands of pictures, but with all of the pictures which are visually similar, magically grouped together. And finally, we've talked about these generative adversarial models, which try to dream up new kinds of human culture, which have never existed before. Um, and with that, I'd just like to say thank you and take any questions.